Baca and also to Daryl Watson. Uh, we want to give you a two-minute intro, and then after that, we'll be asking questions. We ask that we can limit those to two minutes or less uh, because of the time. We apologize for the lateness of the hour. I'm going to go ahead and open up, uh, Ms. DeBaca, if you would, C. DeBaca, if you would uh, do your intro, and then we'll have the introduction by Daryl Watson. And you need us to use both mics, right? Yes. Okay. yes. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Candy Sedevaca, the current D9 City Councilwoman and a fifth generation, well, sixth generation uh, native of my district now. Um, I am a first generation high school graduate from Manuel High School. I was raised in the east side in poverty uh, by my grandparents and my single mom. Uh, we relied heavily on public assistance and city run programs, and so I consequently became a social worker and a community organizer and a policy expert. Uh, prior to taking office, I was able to work at all three levels of government. I worked out in DC under the Obama administration, um, and I got to organize with Cesar Chavez's daughters nationally. And then I came back to Denver and got to work at the state legislature as a government affairs director for the Colorado Children's Campaign. Um, I was lucky to have an open position at an organization I co-founded in college, Project Voice, a youth development organization, um, and took over that organization in 2015 and was working on youth development and um, youth violence interruption through pro-social activities. I have lots of experience with crafting policy and a lot of the behind the scenes work and I've co-founded and founded several critical D9 serving organizations. My commitment in my role as a city councilwoman has been to center the margins and I have successfully done that I believe in all of my policy proposals and all of the work that I've done um, to advance a different culture on council. I believe that housing should be a human right um, food should be a utility and utilities should be municipally owned and that we need to reimagine our economy in a way that does not exploit land, labor, resources, and black and brown bodies for profit. I value co-governance, transparency, courage, and collective liberation and I hope to earn your, your support today and I'm excited to answer the questions you all have in store for us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us to this uh, important discussion. My name is Daryl Watson. I'm a candidate for Denver City Council for City Council District 9. I encourage you, uh, folks who are going to be viewing this, as well as the folks in the audience, to learn more about my campaign to go to www.watson, W-A-T-S-O-N, for F-O-R-Denver.com to learn more about my campaign. Let me share a little bit about my background and what I'm rooted in as to why I'm running for this race. Uh, I was born the youngest of seven, a single mother in the Virgin Islands, uh, raised in the projects. Uh, understanding from looking through her life and looking through the lens of her life of fighting uh, with our landlord on a regular basis to make sure she can carry the rent um, so we can stay in our house uh, for another month. Um, we went to the grocery store and caught the bus there and we bought too many groceries, um, negotiating um, with the um, uh, taxi drivers to be able to pay the cab the next day because we couldn't get back on the bus. These things um, have rooted me in my belief that a city council member, a city leader, must fight for those, fight for us in our community um, that can't fight for ourselves, that need leadership to put forward policy in collaboration with them and with community that sustains them in the communities that they love. Uh, I've had a 30-year career in finance, and I was intentional. I chose, because I grew up in poverty um, within my family, to take a career that I can help not only myself, my family, but my community um, build wealth. And I'll speak to that as a council person and the work that we should do, um, not just to sustain where we're at, but to make sure our communities come along and that we break the wealth, the wealth gap between black and brown families. We have an important opportunity in this election to elect a person that brings folks together of all communities in all places throughout all of District 9. There are nine neighborhoods that make up our community. And I have met with and listened and spoke with um, folks in each of those communities. Uh, my support across the board um, of my collaborative leadership is demonstrated by my current support from current city council members, uh, former mayors, 
um, former union members, and former folks within, and p folks in businesses. Um, I have one of the widest um, uh, degree of support across the city. I look forward to work as a city council person to focus on progress and not division um, when it comes to city council district nine. District nine, and I look forward to answering your questions and engaging with you in this discussion this afternoon. Mr. Baca, God bless you. C. DeBaca. Um, starting with you, Ms. C. DeBaca, what would be the first priorities if you are elected in uh, District 9? What are your first priorities as, as being uh, on the city council? Um, one, I think, would be to help our new colleagues get onboarded. Um, one of the most challenging parts of getting into city council um, is that there's no real built-in orientation on what we do, how we do it. And we've got a pretty large crop of new folks on council. And so for me, um, as a collaborative leader, I would love to train and support my colleagues in knowing their role because it does take quite a while to, to learn your position. The second thing as far as policy is concerned, because that's culture, the policy piece of it would be to um, really figure out what our new colleagues on council want to achieve together in the four years that we're on council and where we can find some common ground to create an agenda that's efficient and streamlined. I think right now it's not very efficient and streamlined. Council members um, currently don't tell each other what they're running. Um, there's not a, an efficient way to know where there is common ground and where we can consolidate research and then on the policy piece of it, housing. Housing is our top issue in the city, the entire spectrum of it, from homelessness um, to affordable housing. And I think that a lot of new folks um, who are coming on to council are coming on with an idea that we can implement social housing. And that will take a lot of research and a lot of work and a lot of that common ground that we need to establish in the culture. And I would love to start there with that, with social housing, but also amending our expanding housing affordability ordinance, which I think was a complete developer giveaway that needs to be changed immediately. Thank you. And sir, uh, thank you for the question. I think the first 100 days, one of the important, thing, important things to do is to look at the coalitions and the collaborations over the last four years that really have not occurred and really bring back those coalitions. For example, um, over the last four years, a Denver City Council has not met um, collaboratively with Denver Public Schools and their leadership. Um, as we are facing some dire uh, situations with our public schools and safety within our schools, making sure that we make that a priority in the first 100 days to rebuild that relationship. Denver Health Authority as well um, used to be a quarterly meeting, a, a discussion between um, City Council and Denver Health Authority uh, bringing back that collaborative uh, process is essential. On policy, um, looking specifically at five points, um, we've had a decimation from my um, belief, and I'm sure that you would agree, when it comes to black businesses that have lost their businesses in five points over the last four years. Making sure that our economic development within our community and the support of economic development throughout the five points region, not just on the Welton Street corridor, is a priority and hiring someone that focuses on that um, economic development and that outreach will be uh, one of my first and foremost uh, policy focuses. Thank you. I'm going to pass over to Bishop uh, Jerry Dimmer uh, to ask his questions. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, and welcome to you, Mr. DeBaca, as well as Mr. Watson. I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask you, and this question is actually going to be a part one and a part two. So I'll start with part one of this question, and this question simply is: What is your stance on reparations for African American people? We just want to know your thought on it. Uh, we'd like to know, and I'm going to uh, prerequisite it at as far as: it, Do you believe it needs to be a combination of things as far as college, HBCUs, or finance? as far as us just receiving uh, a check, I'm going to ask you that, that's part one. What is your stance, or do you not believe in it at all? 
Thank you, uh, Reverend Demmer. Uh, I believe in reparations. And I can share a little bit of my background. Uh, being a, a business person, I um, managed a wealth management group at TIAA, um, teams that help to build wealth for nonprofits, um, educators across uh, the country. And one of my roles with making sure that our wealth management process um, was working is that I specifically, uh, we develop a social equity um, lens for wealth uh, development and wealth growth. Um, from identifying folks for uh, interns, identifying folks for roles within our wealth management group, and also identifying colleges that we weren't, as far as TIAA, engaged with because they're uh, um, historically black colleges. The first thing that we did is to make sure that we're providing investments to hire uh, a greater percent of folks from HB HBCUs, so making sure that we're investing in the communities and making sure we're building wealth within HBCUs, black communities, into what was uh, once and foremost uh, a, a completely white um, um, organization. So I believe in uh, reparations and I've demonstrated it even in my private industry work. I believe that reparations should come in many forms. Specifically, let's look at our small businesses um, within five points and the fact that those businesses needed an investment from the city, not just federal dollars from OPER or from in infrastructure dollars, but specific dollars dedicated uh, from the city to make sure that our black businesses uh, support and thrive and our black families thrive. And so I'll specifically have programs to make sure that we have reparations to ensure that our businesses within the corridor and across five points are successful. I'm going, to, I'm going to stay with him for a minute. I just want to make sure that I got good clarity. I think you said through mixed businesses, and you do, you do believe that reparations should go only go to like black businesses, uh, but not individuals. I believe it should go both. So I think uh, there should be reparations specifically to make sure that businesses that are being uh, negatively impacted by um, just the institutionalized racist policies that we've had for small business loans, access to, uh, to funds, that we provide dollars and support for small black businesses as well as individuals. So I was one of uh, original uh, supporters of Mark um, Donovan has this uh, Denver basic income uh, process that he's rolled out to the city. Two and a half years ago, me and Mr. Donovan met. Um, and part of the Denver basic income uh, policy or process is to provide $1,000 a month to folks that are uh, un underprivileged, folks who are meeting financial um, difficulties, I will expand that program, and we did, with bringing it to the Department of Housing Stability and actually expanding it. Thank you. Mrs. DeBaca. Thank you, absolutely. Um, my, my family's background and legacy is in Black Wall Street, and I think that that's part of what informs what I believe. Capitalism was built on stolen land, stolen labor, and stolen resources. And a check today could not um, undo the cumulative impact of generations of that stolen wealth in all of those categories. And so I think it has to come in the form of land, labor, and resources in an ongoing fashion. And there are structures that we have that could be flipped to begin to do that, that reparations. Um, in fact, my opponent here mentioned five points and the corridor and what has happened to our businesses there. Part of what has catalyzed that um, exponential decimation of black businesses is the five points bid, the business improvement district, which further steals um, from the community through taxation. And I think there's a model that could be redistributive. Instead of a bid collecting extra taxation from the black and brown businesses that are struggling, you could be collecting those extra taxes from white-led businesses all over the city and redistributing them to black and brown-owned businesses who are not part of the bid or who are simply just black or brown-owned. And that's one way to give back um, in the business for fashion. I think when we talk about um, resources being returned, this is where consumer owned or municipally owned resources are important because we are locked out of uh, owning our control or over our basic needs like um, water or utilities or any of those things. There is a way for us to change that structure and put black and brown people in ownership positions over 
our basic needs. I also really um, want to point out that the basic income project uh, could be, if it were focused, uh, an important way to return a check to an individual in an ongoing fashion, but cr in its current format is not reparations or not close to reparations. One, it doesn't focus on black and brown people. Two, what they are experimenting with is unhoused people and it's not a livable or prosperous wage, it is a welfare wage and we know how that has worked. Those types of checks have not served us well and we need to go far beyond um, welfare wages and go to prosperous wages because we don't want to just survive anymore and reparations goal should not be survival, it should be repairing the harm which is this entire economy. Thank you. I'm going I'm to stay with you for part two. Let's stay with you, Mrs. DeBacco. So then would you vote for reparations for African Americans if it is left to the state? And, and I want to say that again. Would you vote for reparations for African Americans if it is left to state and city? Absolutely. Mr. Watson. Absolutely, but uh, may I ask a, a question? I want to clarify two parts of what the, the council members shared. For the daily basic income, um, the, it's in the first year of its process, and the demographics for folks who are receiving a daily basic income is not just folks that are homeless. Um, there are folks who are in supportive housing and folks that are transitional housing, and it is targeted 70% are African-American women, single mothers with children. That's the specific target for that, so it's incorrect what the council member shared. And then number two, when it comes to the bid and five points, uh, I'm not a part of the bid, but the difference in our leadership style is I know that the five points bid has a role in our community. There are black folks that we all know around this table that are part of the bid. Instead of attacking the bid, look at how you can work with them collaboratively. I've met and spoke with them. They are receiving uh, reparations dollars from Denver Downtown Partnership from white corporate businesses to bring uh, to the Five Points Corridor and to bring to Welton Street. These are the facts as to that a contractual partnership set up between Denver Downtown Partnership and the Five Points bid. So as a black leader, my focus will be to work with black leaders where they're at to bring us to coalition and collaboration and not to attack them for the work that they're doing, but to move them towards um, better work within the community. Because that you did um, Can I get a specifically rebuttal? bring up Mrs. DeBaca, we will allow that all right, Mr. Sure. We will allow at least maybe a two minute rebuttal for that. I don't think you disproved what I said. I think you emphasized that there's a prioritization on still people who are struggling to survive. Not all black people in this city are struggling to survive, but every black person in this city should benefit from reparations or any program that is aiming to do reparatory work. Um, I would also say that when we talk about the bid, it is specifically not to attack the individuals within the bid, but to attack the structure. And that is the only way toward justice. We cannot participate or be complacent, complicit in oppressive structures because we have a friend or two who are a part of them. We have to interrogate the structure while supporting the people who are a part of them and who need us to support them. And when we look at the bid, we were often supporting black business owners who were willing to exploit other black business owners. And that needs to be called out and we need to also make sure we don't stand behind that and be complicit. Thank you. want to make sure we don't address each other. Uh, uh, this is not a debate. We, we want to hear from you personally as to what your goals, aspirations, and administrative skills are. So we want to make sure we don't, we don't do that. Is that okay? Excellent. Thank you all. Uh, according to the Denver Post, the election results were 44.2% to 43%. Uh, percent, or excuse me, 43.56 percent to 43.95 percent uh, in the general election. So with that being stated, in a single sentence, could you tell us why you are running for this particular seat? We'll start with you, Dale. To be the voice of folks who have not been heard in the last four years and to fight for their uh, focus and their ability to be a part of this uh, city and part of the decisions this city makes. Thank you. 
to continue recentering the margins and lifting up the voices of people who are historically silenced or erased because of the color of their skin or because of how much money they make. Excellent, thank you. And second question, and we'll start with you, Kenya, for this one, is how specifically do you plan to engage the African-American community within the confines of the district? Let's set the record straight here. The African-American community, the black community, is my community. And so there is no separation between the way that I do my work and the way that someone white may do their work. I go home to the black community. That is what I deal with. And so for me, all of the work that I do is specifically, like I said earlier, to center the voices of black and brown people in this city to do two things, to reclaim what has been stolen and to rebuild new institutions and systems that benefit us. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think um, representing the black community means being in the black community. I am from the black community. I am part of the black community. And when the black community, community asks for you to be there, to listen, to sit, and to engage, whether it's in candidate forums or it's to be in their uh, places of business, is that you show up and you show up on a regular biz, uh, basis. So as a city council person, not only every four years when I'm running will the black community see me, I will be there every week, every month. I will set up um, groups um, within the black community as part of my kitchen cabinet, and they already are informing my campaign and working with me. Excellent. Last very quick and final question for you. We'll start with you, Daryl. Uh, what do you believe the most pressing issue would be uh, should you be elected to the seat that you would intend to address initially, and how would you do that? Uh, sir, I think it's housing, uh, absolutely. I think it's extremely important that we have housing for workforce housing for black and brown families, um, for um, black and brown working families, whether they're union members, whether they're folks that work in shops, making sure that we can have that. And as a civilian, not an elected official, I helped to shepherd in the only affordable housing mandate um, that the city has, that any municipality has put into place. So I will make sure that that 18-month process that I worked with, uh, collaborated with close to 400 other um, Denverites, um, elected officials, as well as housing experts across the state to help to develop, that we will make sure we take a look at that um, expanding housing affordability make whatever changes that are necessary, but I will continue working on policies also, like the prioritization policy that we also began shepherding uh, through um, the Department of Housing Stability that provides for black and brown families that were displaced in the last four years to have priorities for affordable housing. These are two policies that we have shepherded, that I've received support 100% from the board that I lead, and we expect to receive um, um, support from city council. Thank you. Thank you for supporting the housing prioritization policy. That was something I championed. Um, and I do think housing is our top need. And I think that there is one component of it that we need to highlight. Um, our current <coughs> affordable housing scheme is a developer scheme that is not solving the problem. And so I think we need to really deal with the way that we subsidize federal and state monies and tax credits for developers. Currently, the city's budget only allocates 2% of our entire city budget toward housing, and it's our top issue. That is a problem, and in order for us to solve the housing problem, the housing crisis, um, we need to experiment with things like social housing, which is city-owned housing for people across all income levels where they all only pay 30% of their income. That way we don't concentrate poverty in a way that makes public housing what public housing is notorious for. Um, we need to also, in the short term, experiment with master leasing. I heard um, one of the mayoral candidates promoting this idea, and I've been promoting this since day one on council. Master leasing is a good interim solution for us as we build new housing because we have so many vacant units downtown for commercial units, we could be adaptively reusing those. Um, we could also be using the vacant market rate units where we are putting people w until we build new housing instead of waiting years and years before we get housing. The top affordable housing developer in the city is our housing authority, which is not city-led. 
and they can only build 300 units a year. We have a shortage of nearly 40, 50,000 units. We will never catch up and every year, the way that it works when it's based on AMI, more and more people fall further and further down on that spectrum of AMI and we're not building for anybody below 60% AMI. And most of our people, especially in black and brown communities because of the intersection of oppression and class and race are making less than 60% AMI. And so it's big, but housing, that's the top issue. So just for clarity, can you clarify what AMI stands for that acronym? AMI is what all affordable housing is based on, area median income. And the area median income has trended upwards every year from 10% to 15%. So anyone in an affordable housing unit, it is catered to different brackets of the AMI. So someone, so most builders are building for people at 80% of the area's median income. The generous ones will go down to 60% of the area median income. That's still about $40,000 for a family. Almost all of our people who are working wage jobs, minimum wage jobs, they're not even at 60% AMI. And so when it changes from year to year, affordable housing rents also jump based on the change. So if the AMI increases 10% in one year, every single affordable housing unit that was built that previous year for different brackets jumps that 10%. It's unallowable. The state lets them do that. Yeah, and, and, and I'll just be quick on that as well. I think the, the power of a city council person um, Let's say, for example, when, when I'm in for the next four years, I will be speaking to policies that I have led to tackle um, uh, affordability for 60% and below. So the example I provided of, of helping to pass uh, the one affordable housing mandate that goes from 60 and above, that's a policy that I've led as a civilian. Um, I haven't thought about it. I haven't tried to work it. We did, over 18 months, pass that one piece of legislation there are many others that we will do, and I, I am saying to you as a council person, it's good to say that these things need to happen and that the majority of black and brown families are living below 60% AMI, but after four years when I'm sitting here again, I'll talk to you about the policy I brought city council members together to vote on, similarly like I passed the policy when before I became a city council person. Um, we do have the ability to have land trusts right now within the city and county of Denver, and we do have many land trusts across a District 9, ensuring that we use Prop 123 funds that both of the mayoral candidates just spoke about and leverage that $350 million to ensure that the type of land trust deed-restricted uh, development occurs requires leadership on council, not just simply saying that it needs to be done, but getting it done. Um, I've done po policy as an unelected official and what I promise to you is that four years from now, I won't be talking about what I'm thinking of or what I'm hoping to do. I'll bring forward the very clear policies that I'm passing. Thank you. Um, could you all clarify um, the district that, you, you, that you're, you're representing and serve? Explain what that, what, what is the district? What does it cover? Uh, Candy, we'll start with you on that one. We have eight neighborhoods in our district. Um, and would it be more helpful for, the, for me to name the neighborhoods or the boundaries? You can do both. So the boundaries um, go from our county line on the north with Adams County to about Colfax. And then um, on the west side, the boundary would loosely be the river, the Platte River. And it cuts down through downtown through 20th and then cuts over to 18th 17th, um, and then basically cuts off City Park and gives us one, one block, one precinct of City Park. But we have Glowville, Elyria, Swansea, Cole, Clayton, Whittier, Skyland, um, North Park Hill, and South, and South Park Hill. 
and MLK is the line between us in Park Hill, and we don't have all the way through Park Hill. We have Monaco cutting us off, and then Colfax. Okay, thank you for that, and I know that's not a question we need to follow up with, Daryl, <laughs> unless it's an area she forgot. <laughs> um, my question would be for both of you as well, is knowing the area that you just spelled out, which is you know huge in its uh, representation, um, what role can you play, and we've already talked to the mayoral candidates about you know the homelessness, but can you play within your district um, in dealing with the homeless situation because so many are still struggling with them in their doorsteps when they walk out in the community. So what can you do in that effort, and then what is your perspective on any of the police support in that effort as well? Um, I've been a huge proponent of innovations that I have led that exist because of my advocacy including our safe outdoor spaces, um, including the, the safe parking initiatives, um, including motel acquisition for motel vouchers and transitional housing. Um, because of my advocacy, the city purchased a shelter, which we didn't do before I was on council, and um, we have a 24-hour shelter. We um, also need to have a pipeline to transition unhoused people into housing, which means we do need to cater to those bottom brackets of AMI. And I'm glad land trusts were brought up because I actually co-founded um, the first and only community-led land trust in the city of Denver. There are, there are not a lot of land trusts in the city of Denver, but ours is the only one that is community-led, and we catalyzed the beginning of other land trusts and the investment from the city into that innovation. And so for the budget, um, we also need to be investing in trash pickup um, of encampments. I fought for that every year, and one day I'm gonna get it. Uh, hand washing stations, we've fought for more restrooms, like the public mobile restrooms. We've been lucky enough to get support with one, but not at the rate that we need them. Um, and frankly, that master leasing I mentioned earlier is the quickest best way to get people off the street and under a roof ASAP. And that, I think, serves both housed people and unhoused people. And then uh, the other part of that was also the police. Oh, and the police piece of it. Police don't want to deal with unhoused people. Um, I, I'm the only candidate here that's endorsed by the FOP, and I'm endorsed by Delph. Um, this is our, med our first responders, um, our sheriffs who have to respond to unhoused people when we arrest them. And when we put them in the jails, they are not being served the way they need to be served. And both parties agree, the people who are in the jail and our folks who have to take care of them in the jail. We don't have the services that we need. And so I think that um, when it comes to the Department of Safety, we need to give sheriffs a voice in what is happening. They're currently, um, the black sheep of the safety family and don't have a lot of power. And I think that creating a metro department that inc that gives them a voice to have a say about how we treat the unhoused and where we put them to call and time, what Dave. alternatives Thank we can you. create. Thank you so much for the question. Um, I think there is a, a need for elected officials to begin uh, this dialogue, and begin policy based on compassion. Um, and I always share uh, the story of uh, my, my older sister um, uh, died um, homeless on the streets. Um, uh, it was a, about a 10 year journey with our family, um, finding ways to keep her um, housed and off the streets and, and we weren't successful. And so as an elected official, my work and my policies will be rooted in making sure that other families don't go through the pain um, that our family goes through pretty much every year as we consider this. So. How, what can we do for our folks who are unsheltered throughout our communities? Uh, number one, we need to make sure that we are focusing on their total need, their end-to-end -end support, and funding it. Um, as the chair of the Housing uh, Advisory Board, we've doubled uh, the spending um, or to fund the budget for um, uh, wraparound support for mental health, um, wraparound support for supportive housing and creating supportive housing, providing specific dedicated funding for purchasing of motels, um, across the city, um, that's something that's essential that was not part of the budget and things that we have led to make sure that that continues to occur. We also doubled the funding for the STAR program 
sanctioned outdoor spaces, which provides, I think it has a 70% success rate for folks who are transitioning from unsheltered to transitional housing. Um, and we've doubled their spending and their funding as well. Um, we can't solve the homelessness issue uh, on our own in Denver. We have to have a regional approach. Um, and so I'm currently meeting with regional leaders like Mayor Adam Paul in, um, in Lakewood, discussing issues on how can we, because the imaginary boundary between Denver and, and Lakewood and Jeffco, um, is, it's, it's imaginary, uh, folks migrate. We need to look for regional solutions. We don't have enough land to build supportive housing um, for everyone. So we need to make sure that we're providing transportation as dedicated and free for folks who are outside the center core of Denver to come back to um, the service providers. And I apologize, sir, I, I may, may I ask to at least answer the, the police piece just a little quickly, just for one minute. Very quickly, um, police are not um, the solution. We need to make sure that we're funding alternative uh, responses to Denver police. Um, and once again, funded uh, the STAR program um, to make sure that we have alternative responses and also increasing the budget for Denver Health, which takes care of the health and mental health of, of, of our, our unsheltered. My first question is directed to you, Candy. Um, given the fact that you have been deemed a proven leader in the community, um, that you've taken roots, um, that you have really made an impact uh, and really surprised a lot of people who didn't see you succeeding, what is it that has influenced you to run again for this seat, particularly given the fact that you're about to be a new mother? Um, what is it that you feel you will do different or in addition to other than what you've already answered? I think the biggest factor in my decision to keep going um, was the fact that we were having such a huge turnover on council. There were five open seats and a mayoral transition. Um, and initially my goal was to just make sure to stabilize our district throughout that trans transition, but it was, my passion was reinforced in listening to every candidate across every race, um, champion many of the ideas that I was condemned for or that I lost votes on. They are all now the things that are at the center of our conversations, um, for innovating in our city. And so I was reinvigorated by that and the potential to implement many of them I think has become a lot more real, uh, both from the, admin, the executive side of government and the legislative side of government. And that's what's um, really exciting about my next term. And I don't know if I'll do things um, differently. I think now we just have other folks who wanna do them the way we've been proposing, so. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Watson, given what uh, Candy has accomplished, what is it that you see as your mission? What do you believe that you can do better or different that will really be of benefit to your district? Uh, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think as I, I look at first part of the question, look at uh, uh, Councilmember Sidibaka's tenure. There are uh, a lot of things that the council member proposed that I flat out disagree with. I think what the opportunity is for leadership and what I will do as a council person is actually work effectively to execute on some of these progressive ideas. Um, I have been working collaboratively with many of the folks who are currently elected um, within Denver City Council as well as many of the folks who are running for Denver City Council as well. And I think my passion and where my skill comes in is that over the decades that I've been doing um, work within community, I've always brought community members together on positive change. And that's why you know, Progressive Democrats of America endorsed my campaign. They saw that progressive values require actually progressive action and the ability to actually execute on those ideas. So, um, my focus on housing, uh, my focus on the unsheltered, my focus on the environment, 
all of those things I know has consensus support, and I'll push for those things. Thank you, and I'm sorry, uh, Pastor Topaz, but we're going to have to move. Uh, President uh, Mays has a question, and then we'll have the uh, one-minute uh, closing remarks. Oh, just real quickly, have you endorsed one of the mayor candidates, and if so, who? I have not. I've asked them both to endorse me. I have not, and I, I do believe I can work effectively with either one of them. All right, before we do, that's pretty bold, Mr. Watson. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you won't endorse them, but you want them to endorse you. Amen. Uh, Ms. Cedarbach, if you have your last minute uh, closing remarks, and then give to Mr. Watson. Yes, um, thank you for allowing us this opportunity um, to get your support. Um, it, for me, I think it's, it's clear that I have proven myself not just to the city of Denver, but to this community specifically. I've worked on um, many unpopular issues and pushed them through to a point where they're now table talk. Um, we have a lot of opportunity ahead of us. I do have a broad range of support, including former mayors, including over 30 progressive organizations, uh, many unions, including some of our safety unions. Um, I think that I am the candidate for this job because we need the continuity. We need someone where there's not gonna be a learning curve. Um, and we need somebody who's gonna help other people where there is a learning curve to get them up to speed so that we can move quickly, especially as um, black and brown people who are now facing the cultural transition we discussed in the previous candidates uh, forum. We need to make sure we secure the ground that we have so that we don't lose any more ground in a city that is very quickly erasing us. And nobody has proven that they are going to work harder for that than I have, no matter the personal cost to me. Thank you. Thank you so much for holding this forum. I think the most important characteristic or value of a leader is one that's willing to listen, um, one that's willing to work with others, especially those that don't agree with them. Um, I think if you read through each of the folks who have endorsed my campaign, the one theme you're going to hear through each of their voices, whether they're organizations or they're individuals, it's not that I agree with Daryl on everything. Um, but over the years that I've known Daryl and that I've worked with Daryl, he's been willing to come and sit and listen and work with me for the good of the people, um, not just his own interest. Uh, your next city council person within this community you need a champion for this community as your next city council person. Not just someone that's going to be here during the election, but it will always be here. And when you call for us to come and sit and listen and answer the tough questions, that we will show up. We will be present. Um, I am honored to have this uh, opportunity to ask for your vote, to ask for your support, and to fight for it. 7,180 folks in District 9 uh, supported my campaign. Uh, Quan Atlas, who was the third candidate um, in this race, um, chose to endorse my campaign for the same values that I just shared. My willingness to listen to him throughout this campaign and my willingness to work with him on shared solutions. I will continue to do that as your leader in District 9. And I look forward to earning and continuing to fight for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Can we give them a hand praise?